All right, guys, it is an absolutely beautiful spring day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this gorgeous Saturday afternoon in Garfield, Texas. That would be April 25th, 2020, and uh, I am Sam Mitchell. This is my little co-pilot, Sancho Panza, and for a couple more weeks, we're going to be here at Collapse Chronicles doing what we do. Uh, and I am, that is chronicling the collapse of a planet. And I'm also holding an open house. And this is the third time I have tried to bring today's uh, chronicle of the collapse. The real estate market is uh, still alive and well in Austin, Texas. Uh, I hope this wind isn't going to be too much of an issue on this microphone. Anyway, so for the third time, what I'm trying, what I've been attempting to do is to read this long, long uh, essay from our old buddy Robert Scribbler. I have not, uh, we haven't checked in with Robert for a while, and uh, I'm going to put the link on here, and you can read this book link essay yourself. Robert has done his homework on hydrogen sulfide. Uh, the growing threats of hydrogen sulfide reappearing uh, to, you know, just to bring the sixth mass extinction to a rapid close. How uh, it's this nasty chemical, uh, you know, it's the, the suicide stuff. It's, it's uh, hydrochloric acid and sulfur, you know, the way you kill yourself. Uh, it was the Bhopal, uh, that Union Carbide uh, thing that happened in Bhopal, India, that killed about 5,000 people in about two minutes uh, years ago. That's what we're talking about. And uh, what Robert goes, he has done his homework and this big discussion on uh, all of the evidence that we are heading into another, what is they call it, a Canfield Ocean. Canfield Ocean, where basically the, just the perfect storm of uh, things happen, uh, mainly one of them being deoxygenation of the ocean. Uh, combined with uh, ocean heating, I just did a, covered yesterday another article about how the ocean is losing oxygen and how the newest threat to coral reefs is actually that the the oxygen is disappearing out of the ocean and this is uh, as it is heating the ocean is getting hotter and losing oxygen which is the absolute perfect combination for a return to a Canfield Ocean event uh, where this hydrogen sulfide is going to come bubbling out of the ocean and pretty much kill all of us. Uh, it is, was it the Permian extinction caused, they think, uh, the evidence points to a hydrogen sulfide explosion uh, that caused that mass extinction and the, all the ingredients. But anyway, I'm going to put the link to this long essay and you can read it yourself because every time I start to read it, somebody else shows up for the open house. The name of this essay is Awakening the Horrors of the Ancient Hothouse, Hydrogen Sulfide in the World's Warming Oceans. And but at the end of it, he just does this this little postscript and with this, this sweet uh, eulogy to this uh, old friend of his. And I'm just going to let you read all of this uh, information and educate yourself about hydrogen sulfide. And let's get to the very bottom. And then we're just going to sit here and read this sweet postscript. Okay, but let's finish up. Let's get to the, uh, let's read about the last 
two or three paragraphs of the actual piece. Okay. It is important to note that we observe heightened levels of hydrogen sulfide gas in the world ocean system now as hypoxia and anoxia progress with the human caused warming of the oceans and as glacial melt interrupts and alters the now strong ocean currents and related mixing. He talks a lot about how this stuff it, it is mixed and brought up to the surface. It is certain, it is certain that hydrogen sulfide production in the deep ocean will continue to increase resulting in, ele in elevating levels of harm to ocean dwelling animals and ever more numerous instances of hydrogen sulfide gas contact with coastal and surface waters. Yeppers. <clears throat> in the context of increasing ocean hypoxia and stratification, we might do well to remember that we are tiny, weak beings at the mercy of great natural forces which we can barely conceive or understand, forces that we have unwittingly, callously, and ignorantly set into motion. And then he adds this as a personal postscript. He's going uh, to tell us about his old friend Rick. And I just thought this was a nice story. And so I'm going to share it with you if I can get through it without someone else showing up at my open house. Take it away, Robert Scribbler. Tell us a story. Long ago, when I was a 10-year-old child, I was fortunate enough to meet an amazingly kind, adventurous, and inquisitive man. The man, whom I will call Rick, to keep safe his identity, was a bit of a local paramour in ocean and bay research. He was constantly in contact with both the ocean and adjacent Chesapeake Bays, where venturing out to explore and to conduct research on marine life. In later years, he would be the impetus behind animal summer marine science camps hosted by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Uh, but this was later. Now, Rick was helping an elementary school student present on the issue of our then expanding understanding of marine science. Living so close to the bay and ocean, I was intimately in contact with the living boundary of land and sea in the more demanding and less stimulating form that was public education, I seldom had the opportunity to indulge my passion for the oceans. But at age 10, I was given the opportunity to give a broad marine science presentation for my classmates. As part of my project, I constructed posters and models depicting the current state of world ocean research. I graphically illustrated the various knowns of the bathosphere, the light and life filled ones, and the more mysterious and far less well understood depths. But Rick was the centerpiece of my presentation. He was my keynote and he energetically answered all my own and fellow students' questions, speaking in the kind and intriguing manner that would later draw so many of us into his charismatic orbit. Don't tell me, am I going to get interrupted a third time? Nope, they went on. In later years, I would attend Rick's summer marine science camps on two different occasions. In both cases, 
I observed what appeared to be his increasing concern about both the health of the Chesapeake Bay and the neighboring oceans. In later years, Rick's attitude, once so full of optimism, bordered on cynicism. Hmm, imagine that. The world he loved so deeply was experiencing death on a scale that horrified him and he harbored a deep sense of betrayal that we were not doing more to stop the senseless slaughter of so many of the living things he saw as both beautiful and wondrous. In the mid-2000s, Rick committed suicide. To me, one of the great ocean pioneers of my developmental years had passed away by taking his own life, and I couldn't help but wonder if the horrible ways in which the oceans that he so loved were, were changing was just too much for him. If the commercialization and cheapening of all the things he held most dear along with their subsequent damaging and putting at great risk of terrible harm had robbed his life of beauty and purpose. Rick was, if anything, a very intelligent and sensitive man. He knew what was happening to the bay and ocean on a personal level. When the bay was harmed, it was as if it hurt Rick too. Rick also knew how temperature changes affected the depths, for he was on the front line studying it. He was hauling up the fish and water samples. He was doing the measuring with his own hands. Was the awakening of terrible Cthulhu, this, this goes back to earlier in the thing, uh, uh, was the hypoxia, and I'm sorry, I don't have a definition for hypoxia. Anoxia, I'm pretty sure it means disappearing oxygen. Was the form of hypoxia, anoxia, and deadly hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria too much for Rick to continue bearing mute witness? Did his pleas to those working in the marine science community fall only on deaf ears? Was it just too much for this sensitive feeling and intelligent man to bear? If Rick taught me anything, it was that our lives and the lives of the ocean are deeply connected. One cannot remain healthy without the other. In contrast to this basic understanding, the damage our continued industrial emissions of greenhouse gases is doing to the world ocean system is a horrific travesty, and the damage we have already caused, have already done to those most sensitive creatures among us, have already set in play for future decades and centuries is tremendous. The ocean suffocates bleeding deadly hydrogen sulfide gas and yet we still continue down this wretched path in pursuit of more terrible things to come. Yep, that pretty much sums it up. Robert Scribbler, the ocean suffocates bleeding deadly hydrogen sulfide gas, and yet we still continue down the wretched path in pursuit of more terrible things to come. And you better believe we will find more terrible things to come in our pursuit and uh, once we wake up that big kahuna
the hydrogen sulfide gas monster lurking at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it's safe to say the fat lady will have sung. Anyway, I need to wrap up today's chronicle of the collapse and uh, start to wrap up my open house. I had five people. I still got an hour to go. I've had five sets of buyers come through. I do have the house and contract guys and uh, I really think I'm going to be out of here in a few weeks heading to New York, but you just can't be too careful. Get out there and uh, enjoy breathing before the hydrogen sulfide gas monster reawakens. Bye, guys.